a reading from the 23rd Psalm. The oh, goodness. Okay, let's try this again. A reading from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of St. John, the 10th chapter. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them up and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This, too, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Over the past several weeks, we have heard different voices in this pulpit proclaiming different aspects of who Jesus tells the world he is. We heard Reverend Alston proclaim that Jesus is the bread of life. Then we heard Chaplain Adrian proclaim that Jesus is the light of the world. And last week, we heard Reverend Becky proclaim that Jesus is the gate. And every single week, as I have listened to these wise women preach, I have learned something new. Last week, I was fascinated by this image of Jesus as the gate, explained with a cultural context that I had never before heard. Reverend Becky described this culture of shepherding in which the shepherd lays himself down at the entrance of the sheep enclosure. We heard this image of a gate not focused on keeping people out, but an image of a shepherd laying himself down to care for the sheep that he so loves. Now, most of you know that I come from a two-seminarian household. My husband, Isaac, and I are both fascinated by biblical texts. We come home from church on Sunday, and over lunch, we talk about Sunday school and hard questions we were asked. And all the time, we talk about sermons. For school and for work, we write sermons and we listen to sermons, and we are captivated by God's stories proclaimed by God. How are we doing, Lynn? We're better. OK, great. Great. I've never preached like this, but we're trying something new. All right. For school and for work, we write sermons, and we listen to sermons, and we are captivated by the stories of God proclaimed by God's people. Now, Isaac, too, is preaching this morning across town. And his church follows a calendar called electionary. This calendar is a three-year cycle which I have been told has been used by some of the previous pastors at Washington Street. And in this cycle, over three years, you travel through almost the whole Bible. This particular calendar is called the Revised Common Lectionary, and it's followed by millions of churches. Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Baptists, even Catholics, all work together to make this calendar, 
And so they read the same text on the same day. And you might be thinking to yourself, why am I telling you this? Because today, in the lectionary, it just so happens that these millions of churches are also hearing that the Lord is their good shepherd. And I think that there is something so powerful about this image that right now, this very hour, across denominational boundaries and political lines all over the country, this morning we are all hearing this same ancient text. Thousands of years after God's people wrote these texts, we are all still sheep, and we are all still in desperate need of this same shepherd. Now this morning, I read two texts. I did this because I think one of the things that I have been so captivated by in this I Am sermon series is the context of these I Am statements. And I don't think we can really do justice to the concept of I am the good shepherd without looking backward to the context of the Psalms. These two texts, Psalm 23 and our passage from John's Gospel, they inform each other, and we can't fully understand one without looking at both. Psalm 23 is easily the best known and most quoted of all the Psalms. These Psalms, along with these stories of the Old Testament, they would have been part of the worldview of Jesus and the disciples and the hearers of these scenes. These texts were integral for their understanding of who God is and who they were as a people. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he is clearly drawing them and us backward toward this long history of a God who loves the people of this world. He is drawing us backward to a God who has been proclaimed as the Good Shepherd for thousands of years. This psalm, though it is only six verses, oh, sorry, this microphone is really throwing me off. Okay. This psalm, though it is only six verses, is powerfully poignant. It teaches us who God is, and it proclaims what life is like as the Lord walks with the people of the world through all the chapters of their lives. This text displays life as a cycle, right? And it, and it says that we are always circling through this cycle of life, and it's a cycle in which God is at the center. This was the worldview of the Hebrew people of this time. And this psalm, right, it, it displays that the Lord walks with the people of the world through every chapter of their lives, in our John text this morning, Jesus is proclaiming to his disciples, our God, who you know as the good shepherd, that is me. That is who I am. So this morning, we are going to walk through this psalm and its six verses in order to more fully understand who Jesus is claiming himself to be. Psalm 23, which proclaims that the Lord is our shepherd. This famous text, it takes us on a journey because Indeed, the life of a shepherd is not a stagnant one, but a lifetime of journeying. Now, this is altogether a different kind of sermon than I have ever preached, but we're trying something new this morning. And I'm hoping that y'all will bear with me and come along for the journey. This morning, we're going to walk through this psalm line by line. And I have to give my husband, Isaac, a lot of credit for this idea. But I think this morning, the text itself is sufficient. The text is exactly what we need to hear today, because every chapter of our lives is represented in this psalm. Every chapter of our lives has good news in this text, good news in this image of the Lord as our shepherd. So this morning, let's journey through the text. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. In a culture of wanting more, 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 a culture focused on selfish desire, I just want us to breathe deep here for a moment. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. God's people have always struggled with this. From the very beginning, wanting that fruit from the tree of good and evil, to God's people, the Israelites, complaining of manna in the wilderness because they wanted more and better, to today, where we lust after the possessions of our neighbors, we as God's people have always needed constant reminder. The Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. 
Now remember, we said we were going to walk through the cycle of life, and these are the best days. These are the ones where the sun is on our face and lush grass is at our feet and there is water to quench our thirst. These are the days of our journey that we dream about and the ones that we remember fondly. We, all on this journey of life, have days and seasons like this, and we wish it would last forever. God, in these moments, is with us. In these moments and through these moments, God fills us up. The next line reads, he restores my soul. Now this word soul comes with all kinds of baggage about the afterlife that the world has pushed into the text. But most of that belief about souls after death comes not from the Bible, but from Greek mythology. This Hebrew word for soul is nephesh. I want everybody to say nephesh. Nephesh, nephesh right. Nephesh doesn't mean soul in the afterlife at all. It means the essence of our being, who we are, our life force in the here and now. In our seasons of green pastures and still waters, God is actively restoring the essence of who we are. Now our next line could sum up the Bible from start to finish. It reads, he leads us in right paths for his name's sake. God, in this story of the whole Bible, is continually leading God's people in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, shepherding us in the direction that God is desperate for us to walk. Over and over again, God shows us the path, lays it out before us, and calls us to righteousness. And even though God's people rarely, if ever, regularly choose this path of righteousness, God is still there, calling us right back. God is continually calling us to lives of repentance, lives of faith and justice and mercy and kindness. God leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now our psalm journey takes a turn here. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'd argue that this right here, is the most famous part of the psalm, maybe even the most famous line in our Bibles. This is the line that often draws us to open our Bibles and read this psalm when we find ourselves in dark places. This verse takes us to a different part of our journey, through the valley of the shadow of death, the dark places. And these chapters are inevitably part of our journeys as God's people, too. In these dark places, in the valley of the shadow of death, God, our shepherd, does not abandon us. Notice that in this part of our journey, the text tells us that God comforts us. God is with us. God, in this chapter of our lives, too, is active. The Lord, as our shepherd, is not a passive image, but an active one, busy, working in every chapter of our lives. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. These chapters of our journey are hard. I want everyone to hear this line. You, the Lord, our shepherd, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is not an image in which God makes our lives sunshine and rainbows just because we are faithful enough nor is it an image where everybody wants to be our friend. The life of faith is hard. Being a Christian was never meant to be an easy path. The life of Christ is one where he sits at a table in the presence of his enemies, and following in Christ's footsteps calls us all the time to go and do likewise. The Lord prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. This Christian life is countercultural. It draws us up out of our comfort zones, and it can make those around us angry and uncomfortable. But God sustains us for the journey. God prepares us with bread and, and juice, and the Lord blesses us and feeds us and prepares the way. Notice how active God is. This brings us to the final verse of Psalm 23, where translators have long butchered this Hebrew text. The NRSV, the NIV, the King James Version all translate this in similar ways. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Translators and modern readers have read this to mean, I will go to heaven forever. But hear me when I say that the writers and readers of these Hebrew scriptures did not have such a concept in mind when they wrote these words. Jesus' disciples would not have had this mindset either. Ancient Israelites did not see life as a line starting at birth and ending with heaven, but they saw life as a constant cycle. They would have heard these texts as evidence of the life cycles of life and death and life and death where God is always at work. This cycle of life has God in the middle of it at every step. This cycle is a circle where death is in all the chapters of our life. And through Christ, there is life and death too. Now this ancient text really reads, Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will return to the house of the Lord for a length of days. In this text and in our world, God's goodness and mercy do not just follow along behind us. God's goodness and mercy pursue us relentlessly. They chase after us and call us by name. And this goodness and mercy causes us to return to the house of the Lord, the temple, the church, the communion table. The goodness and mercy which pursue us all the days of our life cause us to return here. This is what completes and fulfills this cycle of dwelling in green pastures and having our thirst quenched and our whole selves washed in the waters, pursuing the path of righteousness, enduring walks in dark valleys, experiencing God's comfort, eating at God's table, returning to God's house again and again. And at every step, God is shepherding us. Y'all, this is what Jesus' disciples would have heard when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. What Jesus is proclaiming here is that the Lord our God, who has long been proclaimed as a shepherd in such a way that this image is Jesus. In this text, we hear with new words that Jesus walks with us, calls us by name, pursues us relentlessly all the days of our lives. This is not a psalm about the goodness in heaven after death. This is a text about life. This is a text about the overwhelming, all-consuming love of God. And it's a text about God who cares about you, not just in the afterlife, but in the here and now of today. Now, last year, before I came to Washington Street, I was what's called the vicar at Mount Tabor Lutheran Church in West Columbia. It's a year of being an intern pastor. And in one year, we facilitated 25 funerals. If you'll do quick math, you'll realize that means I facilitated a funeral about every other week. And at almost every single funeral, the families requested Psalm 23. The Lord is our shepherd. Hear me when I say, if you are in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, God, your shepherd, is right there in the valley beside you. If you are in green pastures or beside still waters, in a chapter so good you don't want to blink because you might jinx it, the Lord, your shepherd, is restoring you in these moments. If you feel like you are starving for sustenance, like you don't know how you will make it through, if you are surrounded by enemies at every turn, or your cup is overflowing with goodness, the Lord, our shepherd, is active and right there with you. No matter where you are in this cycle of life, no matter whether you are a Methodist or Lutheran or Catholic or Baptist or a hodgepodge somewhere in between hearing this text this morning, this text is good news for us all. God is pursuing you relentlessly, calling you by name, calling you to paths of righteousness, prompting you to return to the house of the Lord for sustenance. No matter where you are in this chapter of life, God is beside you, shepherding you, preparing the meal of the bread of life, anointing you with oil, calling you by name. No matter where you are or who you are, the Lord is our shepherd, and this is good news. Amen. <laughs>